we now move to our concluding keynote. Uh, if we've heard one thing today, I would say, is that there's a lot riding on the decisions made by the Secretary of State for the department that I call, personally, because it does have a lot of different names, uh, the Department for Housing at the Centre of Leveling Up. Uh, the Right Honourable Michael Gove, MP, has brought a tangible new energy to the role of Secretary of State for levelling up communities and housing. That is what it's actually called. In his first appearance in the chamber as Secretary of State, he received a challenge from Mike Amesbury, who's Labour MP for Weaver Vale. And Mike spoke about the fact, uh, we've been hearing about this all day today, uh, about the net loss year on year, and in particular, the net loss of 17,500 social homes that year. So he asked, would the new Secretary of State grab the bull by the horns and build a new generation of green homes for social rent at scale? And the new Secretary of State did not reply by reiterating commitment to ambiguously titled affordable homes or refer to money committed that would not actually go on the right homes. Instead, he succinctly replied, not a bad idea. And all of us at Shelter were super excited <laughs> when that happened. <laughs> I can't quite describe the excitement uh, that went on, uh, but it was. And at Shelter, we feel that reflects the straightforward and refreshing approach of this Secretary of State, who has been quick to identify the problem and to commit to taking it on. So I'm very much hoping we're going to hear a little about how he's going to do that in his remarks today. A very warm welcome to Michael Gove. Um, thank you very much, Polly. Thank you for inviting me to uh, this conference. Thank you for the leadership that you have shown at Shelter. And thank you for recognising that the need for more social housing is now at the heart of every party's political agenda, that it is a cause whose time has come. In fact, it's a cause that has been unfairly overlooked and neglected, as Theresa May pointed out in her remarks earlier today. And it's urgent that we address the lack of social housing and the poor quality of social housing at this time. Why urgent? Well, as Theresa reminded you earlier, and is, is in everyone's mind here, um, we're approaching the anniversary of the horrific Grenfell tragedy. And that tragedy was a reproach to the conscience of those of us in power, those of us charged with protecting uh, our fellow citizens and enhancing their lives, because that tragedy uh, encapsulated so much that was wrong with the approach that we'd taken towards social housing in the past. The way in which the voices of tenants were overlooked, the way in which profit and corner cutting were put ahead of the public interest, the way in which it took a tragedy to push back at the heart of our agenda the safety and security of our fellow citizens. Uh, five years on, it is absolutely urgent that we heed the call for change and for reform that came as a result of that tragedy. And I'm going to say a little bit more about the quality of social homes, the voice that tenants require, the professionalization that we should put in to housing in a second. But first, I want to address the vital question of numbers and supply. Because as Theresa reminded us earlier, and as I know almost all of your speakers have pointed out, we've reached a situation for a variety of reasons where the number of people living in social housing, the availability of social housing, is simply inadequate for any notion of social justice or economic efficiency. Uh, the number of people who've been uh, able to access home ownership, to own their own home in this country, has been declining for years now, and it's a, a cause of concern for me as a conservative because I believe that the aspiration to own one's own home one day is a noble thing. But if we look at what's been happening to our mix of housing, it's been the case that uh, uh, even as the number of people who own their own homes has diminished, the number of social homes hasn't increased, the number of people in private rented accommodation has increased instead. And the reason why that's a problem for social justice and for economic efficiency is that we know that the quality of the private rented sector, the circumstances in which people find themselves, the inadequacy of so many of those homes, the fragility and vulnerability that so many people find in their daily lives as a result of that is insupportable and indefensible. 
Of course, the majority of homes in the private rented sector are provided by good landlords who provide a good service. But the cost, even for those who are um, uh, in the care and in the hands of good landlords, compared either to what they would be paying if they had a mortgage or what they would pay if they were in social housing, is again indefensible in many cases. Now, that's a function of broader supply questions, but it's also a critical function of our failure to ensure that there are homes which are genuinely affordable for rent, our failure to ensure that there are more social homes. Now, again, if you believe, like I do, that building up home ownership over time is a good thing, there's a lot that you should do, and we might touch on some of that in the Q&A. But one of the things you need to recognize is that one of the significant barriers to home ownership is acquiring capital over time, and that if people are in the private rented sector, paying the rents they are, particularly in our major cities, the ability to save, to acquire that lump sum, to acquire that capital for a deposit, is vanishingly small. And that is why even the most, how can I put it, Thatcher worshipping, home ownership fetishizing, uh, capital accumulating members of this audience, and as I look around I can see so many of you fit that bill. <laughs> you want more social housing, because you want people to be in decent homes where they can pursue the jobs that they love and save one day for a home that they might want to call their own. Now, home ownership is not everyone's destiny, it's not everyone's choice, but we should be extending that choice to more. But that's not the only reason why we should want to have more social homes. If we want to have functioning communities, if we want to have uh, our cities and towns having places where uh, uh, key workers and individuals who keep our public services going can ensure that they have a decent home over their heads and raise a family in stability and security, then we need more social homes. Uh, Sean Bailey, uh, the a Member of Parliament for West Bromwich, who was due to speak here this evening, uh, this afternoon, but who couldn't be here because of the voting in the House of Commons, would have said to this audience, as he said to so many, that the people that he represents, um, uh, the people who voted for him, uh, want to ensure that they can stay part of a community that they love and that their children can have a chance to be part of a community in which they feel a sense of belonging. So there can be both earning and belonging together. Without more social homes, that becomes almost impossible for them to achieve. And we also need more social homes because we want to have, as I say, more people living in safety and in security and in homes that are contributing towards our drive to uh, net zero and in homes, which also mean that instead of having to rely on housing benefit and the welfare system, which doesn't always work as it should, you have people who have the guarantee of knowing that the rent they pay is genuinely affordable given the income that they have. So the case for more social housing, the why, I think is increasingly well understood and has been made by Shelter for years now, but it's an argument that has reached not just maturity, but urgency in our political debate. So that's the why. What about the how? We all know that we're living at a time of constrained resources. We all know that uh, this government, and if there were an alternative government in place at the time, it would be the same, would find the pressure on public finances significant. But that shouldn't be an excuse for inaction. Uh, the Chancellor, um, in the last spending review, allocated a significant amount of money for affordable housing through the EAHP. Now, in the past, I think it's been the case that some of the money that uh, uh, governments of my coloration have spent on affordable housing have been tilted more towards uh, a particular set of products that are not truly affordable and have not enabled housing associations and others to generate the social housing at a social rent they need. So one of the first things I'm doing, very much in line with the recommendations that Shelter and others have made, is looking at how we can tilt spending within AHP in order to do more to provide uh, homes for social rent. Linked to that, one of the other things that we're looking at are some of the rules that have meant that uh, homes for social rent can only be provided where there's a particular gap in affordability. Uh, that gap in affordability and the way it's been defined has meant that it's been easier, not easy, but easier to provide homes for social rent in London and the southeast and not elsewhere. I want to look at those rules in order to ensure that housing associations and councils across the country can find it easier 
to build homes for social rent. So that is part of using already committed government expenditure. New money in one sense, in that it's there in the, uh, a, in the locker in uh, DLUC, but not new in the sense of anything beyond that which was provided in the spending review, to use that money more effectively. But as well as using existing money that the taxpayer has provided, that's not the only thing that we can do in order to look at how we can unlock more housing and more social housing in particular. Um, the government has access to its own land supply, whether it's the Ministry of Defence, the Department for Transport, uh, or other organs of government. There is land that we have uh, which can be liberated and can be used in the right hands in partnership with local government and others to provide the plots on which we can, in partnership, create the space for new social housing to be built. But more than that, what we can do is we can look at one of the biggest challenges, a challenge which has been identified by Liam Halligan uh, brilliantly in his book Home Truths, one of the biggest challenges that we have in our housing market overall and in our housing supply situation overall. And that is the way in which those who own and hold and operate within the land market have the odds tilted in their favor against the public interest. And we all know, certainly in this room, the debates that occurred in the 1940s about how we could make sure, and Churchill was convinced of this himself when he was a wartime premier, how we can ensure that the uplift in the value of land when development takes place does not accrue disproportionately to the landowner or to the developer, but the uplift in the value of that land is shared more equitably. And what we're exploring is how we can do that, how we can ensure that some of that value can be more effectively captured in order to ensure that we can provide for communities, for councils, and for others, the opportunity to create more social housing. And it's in that light that um, I, I hope you will consider the approach that we are taking towards uh, a potential new infrastructure levy. Um, I know that there will be people in this room who will be worried because, of course, a poorly designed or poorly executed levy could end up backfiring. But at the moment, my concern is that the Section 106 approach that we have, which is one of the tools, as you all know, by which we extract from developers uh, cash to go to local authorities in order to provide the infrastructure or the um, uh, affordable homes or the uh, other benefits that we want to see. One of my concerns is that there's an inequality of arms there, that the major developers in particular can, first of all, out-negotiate local authorities, and then secondly, often come back to local authorities uh, uh, as the development is going forward, saying, oh, we're facing an affordability challenge. We can no longer deliver either the number of affordable homes or the other infrastructure or whatever it is that we thought we could, and the local authorities held hostage by the developer in those circumstances. I think that a well-designed levy can uh, secure from the developer or from uh, the, uh, uh, the promoter of the development at the right time and in the right way money that can be given to local authorities and to others to contribute to a more ambitious and a more sustainable social housing program. Is it easy? No, but the prize I think is significant and I think that we all have to acknowledge that the current system, while it delivers, doesn't deliver enough. So that is some of, uh, of the how. Uh, necessarily, at this stage, high level. Because while we've been working on these policies within the department, uh, there are still discussions to be had, details to be tested, implementation to be developed. But I hope that you can see that we are looking at the available levers within our grasp how we spend the money that we have, how we change the way in which we capture our land value uplift, um, and how we think about the inequality of arms between the developer and landowner and those who are serving the public interest, and that together we're trying to find a way to redress the balance in favor of more social and affordable homes. Um, at the beginning of my remarks, I talked about Grenfell, and I talked about the particular need for us to ensure not just that we built more social homes, but also that we ensured that those homes that we have 
and that we build in the future are decent and that those who live in them are given the rights that they deserve. One thing that I should say, though, before I go on to rights, is that um, there'll be people in this room who have different views about design, about aesthetics, about architecture, about what makes communities. Um, and I think it's good that one should have that debate. I have, I'm a Tory, I have small c conservative views on the aesthetics of building. I don't want to impose them on everyone, but I suspect that there are lots of people out there, whatever their political coloration, who share some of my views on that. But one thing I would say is that there are other people who, of course, admire modernism and love uh, uh, some of the buildings that uh, were built uh, in, the, in the high tide of modernism. But the reason I mention that is that uh, there's a reason why so many social homes were built in tower blocks and in high-rise developments. And it wasn't just because of the aesthetic preference of those who were involved in housing and planning at the time. It was because of land supply. One of the reasons why tower blocks were built is simply because if you were a local authority and you were interested in making sure you could provide the maximum number of homes for people who needed them, you would build up, not across. And of course we know that um, uh, that form of development, and I, again I stress, for some it will be uh, beautiful, for some inspiring, but for some, when they were building those buildings, it was a choice dictated because of the cost of land, because of the limitation of resources, rather than because of a sincere belief that that was necessarily right for all. And I want to be in a situation where councils, housing associations, and others can build attractive and beautiful social homes that fit in with a broader growth of community, rather than, as has sometimes been the case in the past, recognizing that some of the developments that are being built for people who are um, living in social homes look and feel different. Authors like Lindsay Hansley and others have written about this phenomenon. I recognize that it's an area where one has to tread sensitively. But I don't think it's uh, the case that there is anything wrong with us asserting that we want to ensure that the homes that we build in the future are homes that everyone recognizes, are the sorts of uh, homes that people aspire to be in, are proud of, foster that strong sense of identity and pride and beauty. Turning specifically to the question of dignity and voice. Um, I won't go into uh, the Building Safety Bill. I won't go into the arguments that, uh, uh, forgive me, conversations that I've been having about how we can ensure that those who were responsible pick up the costs and those who were innocent are absolved of them. It's a big debate and it's an ongoing one, but one I think which is moving towards the, the right outcome. But as well as the building safety legislation, we absolutely need to have social housing legislation which ensures that the other lessons of Grenfell are learnt. Anyone who's seen any of the documentaries that were produced, some of the immensely moving documentaries that uh, in some occasions relied on footage filmed during the renovation of Grenfell Tower will have seen the way in which the TMO and people associated with it at the time simply weren't listening to the voices of tenants. We need to make sure, and we will in that legislation following on from the white paper, create a more effective tenant voice, a more effective right of redress. We will empower um, the ombudsman in order to ensure that housing associations and providers are held more effectively to account. But one of the other things about the TMO, and I don't want to criticize any individual, but one of the other things about the way in which it operated is there needs to be a greater emphasis on professionalism in housing overall. Um, most people who are in the profession do enter it because of a sense of vacation, because they want to contribute to ensuring that communities have um, uh, high quality homes and that people are listened to. But as campaigners like Quaju have brought vividly to uh, our attention uh, in recent months, uh, even in the best run and most idealistically run housing associations, it can sometimes be the case that there is a lack of professionalism, a lack of uh, uh, attention to the circumstances in which individuals live. Uh, excuses can be made. People are under pressure. A greater degree of professionalism, and again, we can debate exactly how that's delivered, is absolutely critical, I think, to making sure that quality improves. 
But there are two other things as well. I think we need to look at the decent home standard overall. I think that we need to update it in the light of what we know decency truly means. Um, and I think that we also uh, need to ensure that there is a greater level of granular accountability for how housing associations operate. Uh, more data by which they can be held to account, as well as more data um, which lets us know that they are listening and reacting to the tenants that they are there to serve. So it's a significant agenda and a significant challenge. But one of the things that encourages me is that not just in this room, but across the political spectrum now, there is a recognition that all of these problems need to be addressed. It's been in the nature of the remarks that I've made today that I've talked about some areas where I believe that there is a clear and urgent need for change and other areas where we hope to embark upon a particular direction of travel, but we want to work with people in this room in order to ensure that we get it right. By definition, as I've mentioned earlier, there'll be a range of views, I'm sure, disagreements on everything from uh, how effectively we can move towards an infrastructure levy, what should be in forthcoming legislation, and the pace with which we can drive that change. But I'm really grateful to Polly and to all of you for inviting me, inviting Teresa, inviting Sean, and inviting Izzy here uh, for this conference. I hope that you will appreciate that there is uh, a centre-left, a centre, and a centre-right case for social housing, but above all, there is a people's case for reform of social housing, more and better. Thank you all very much.